I'm Dr. Anil Gure. I'm one of the consultants in reproductive medicine surgery and assisted conception at the Homerton Fertility Center. Once again, I bring today an observational study which will answer some of our questions on frozen embryo replacement cycles. Often we are asked in a medicated cycle. Now let's go back to the three ways you can do a frozen embryo replacement cycle. Number one is you can downregulate and then you can add the estrogen. So it's a downregulated and a medicated cycle. Second, you take away the downregulation and you give it only a medicated cycle with estrogen preparation. And the third is natural or modification of natural in the view of stimulated. All these three go to a different discussion and there are much longer discussion to follow. So let us go back and answer this question is how long should the estrogen therapy be and does prolonged estrogen treatment for the frozen embryo replacement cycle reduce success rates. Now this paper was published in 2018 in human reproduction and it looked towards answering that question. Prolonged estrogen treatment prior to frozen blastocyst transfer decreases the live birth rate. Next, what was looked at? It was an observational cohort study, July 2012 to December 2015. IVF or ICSI, less than 42 years, a single blastocyst transfer, and artificial endometrial preparation. And the groups were divided according to the number of days estrogen was given. Endometrial preparation was either through patches, that is 0.2 milligram per day on a transdermal, or was on oral 4 milligram twice a day. The day before starting the progesterone measure, measurements were done and the endometrium was assessed. If the endometrium was less than 6 mm or they saw a high progesterone level rise to 1.5 nanogram per ml, the transfer was cancelled. So what they are looking towards is they are seeing that they, have, they did away with thin endometrium and they did away with where they saw a rise of progesterone. Now again, where would I suggest that you do a progesterone level? Not before, but if you're using a medicated cycle without downregulation, remember there's a cancellation rate and the cancellation rate goes up to almost 10%. Now in those cases, what do you want? You want to know whether there has been some amount of ovarian activity going on and what, what ovarian activity will be detriment to changing the implantation window. The implantation window gets changed if there's a rise of progesterone, which means that if your in intervention with progesterone is preceded by the ovarian intervention of progesterone, you lose that valuable 120 hour plus minus three hours of implantation window. And that's something to be understood. Now look at the th four groups. Group one, again, this is our commonest group. Less than 21 days or equal to two weeks. Group two, 22 to 28 days, four weeks. Group three, 29 to 35 days, five weeks. And group four, 36 to 48 days, equal to or more than six weeks. And this is interesting. Let's have a look at the pregnancy rates. And if you looked at the live birth rate, the clinical pregnancy rates and the early pregnancy loss, your best results came when the duration of estrogen treatment was about between three, less than three or four weeks. Your highest live birth rate came in less than 21 days. But statistically, 22 to 28 days did not go completely off the mark. So less than four weeks, 
you had a live birth rate between 28, 7.8% to 27.7%, and clinical pregnancy rate, which was very much similar, and an early pregnancy loss, which was 28.5% for less than 21 days, and 31% in 22 to 28 days. Now, as the duration of estrogen gets longer, then it was a live birth rate dropped down to 21.8% and the early pregnancy loss climbed up to 34.3%. But as the pregnancy, as the estrogen therapy prolonged to a much longer duration and became between almost six weeks, your live birth rate took a drastic drop at 17.2% and the early pregnancy loss took a rise at 48.6%. Now, what does this paper tell you? For it to be published in human reproduction, it needs to have a certain amount of weightage. Plus, it should answer some questions which clinically are important to us. So, if we have a look at this and say, well, if your estrogen treatment goes longer and longer, what are you trying to do? You're trying to build the endometrium, which is failing to build even after three weeks. And then if you have a look at it closely, you will see that there is a drop to the endometrium. That means its rise is very small, its vascularity changes, and there is in some women a pituitary downregulation that starts. That in fact starts hampering or rather changes the endometrium and probably that may be one of the causes why your implantation tends to get worse. In my practice, I have a very simple policy. If my estrogen treatment goes beyond three weeks, I normally tend to stop it. I generally believe that if your estrogen climbs up at a certain dose, depending on what dose you start, you can start with two milligram. That is a smaller dose, a more gradual rise of estrogen, mirroring a natural cycle, and probably closer to a physiological rise of estrogen. Drawback, the pituitary does not sense that rise of estrogen, and starts slowly allowing the follicle to grow. And that's one of the problems of starting on a lower dose. And I don't know how many, and some of you would have come for the course which I do, and they, I'll, I'll show you those techniques in which, which patients used to decide to give a small, low dose, proceed and slowly increase it, or move to transdermal patches, and in those cases where you want the pituitary to interfere less, you start with a higher dose. I do not believe that going beyond 10 milligram of proganova or estrogen does not seem to help really. And that's something which I hope is a, is a take home message uh, on a shorter note. But here, I think we can learn something from this paper. The longer your estrogen, your pregnancy rates tend to start going down. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Again, a short talk which answers some questions. Do share these videos because it allows knowledge to spread. I do them in my spare time. I put in a lot of effort to get these videos ready. And I'll be extremely grateful if they are shared across so that they help to improve clinical care across in all departments. Thank you very much.